Hi everyone and good morning. Good morning, I'm Maddie. And my name is Matt. And we're part of the team here at the Community Church and we're really happy to have you with us this morning. Yeah, thanks so much for joining in. Um, leave us a comment in the chat, say hello, let us know how you're getting on. Um, we are, what's going on today? Do you want to tell us what's happening? Well, about? first and foremost. Oh yeah, fine. I, uh, I think today is a very special day. It's true. Um, it's Matt's birthday. So actually, yes, in the comments, be sure to wish Matt a happy birthday. Thank you in advance for um, all the kind and wonderful things <laughs> that you all say. Um, but then even more importantly, we have some worship being led by Matt Glover. And then we have Dave Roderick continuing our series on Revelation. Yeah, um, I've watched this talk. It's really, really good. Um, and Matt Glover does a great job as well. So it's a really good service. Thanks again for joining us. And um, shall I pray before we yeah, get into it all? Yeah, definitely. Uh, Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for the fact that we get to do this and we get to watch this service from the comfort of our own home and to catch up on it later in the week as well. God, we just pray that uh, your spirit would be with us wherever we're watching this, whatever the time of the day it is. We thank you that you're here with us. Uh, so be with us, help us to become more like you, help us to worship you through um, these songs. Um, yeah, and spirit, we welcome you. Speak to us and change us for the better. Um, yeah, in Jesus' name, amen. amen.
Well, hi everyone, it's great to be with you. And uh, we're continuing our series on Revelation. And I hope you've enjoyed getting into Revelation as much as I have. I've really enjoyed the last couple of weeks and studying and kind of really getting to grips with this book. And so today we're gonna to take a look at one of the trickier passages. So to give you an idea for the rest of the book, um, we're gonna be looking today at the woman and the dragon. And so kind of how to interpret, how to read one of these kind of incredible sections of Revelation that are full of these fantastical creatures and all this stuff going on. Um, and just a, a brief recap or reminder that uh, Revelation is um, the kind of word we use to describe the Greek word apocalyptic, apocalypse, which is um, to do with drawing back that which is hidden. So pulling back the curtains to reveal what's hidden behind. So what we're doing here in this particular passage in, is drawing back the curtain to see actually what's going on in the spirit, in the heavenly realm at the same time what's behind some of the things that are happening here on earth and once again the golden rule when reading revelation i said it at the start of this series and i'll say it again now is the old testament is the key the better we understand the old testament the easier it is to read revelation because john is such a fan of drawing on those images and that kind of um, he alludes to so much from the old testament and we'll see that time and time again as we go through this passage but there's a, there's a fundamental hermeneutic principle here. So when you're reading scripture, you use the Bible to help interpret the Bible. So it's using other parts of scripture to help you read the bit that's in front of you really well. So as I mentioned, we've got a really fantastic passage to read. So let's jump straight in. So reading from Revelation chapter 12 and verse 1. A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its head. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child at the moment he was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter, and her child was snatched up to God into his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. Crazy stuff, eh? <coughs> so... We're going to look at each of these characters in turn and kind of unpack some of the imagery that's used. So let's start with the woman. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and with the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. So what's being depicted here? Well, we need to look for some clues. So the first clue we see in this passage is the number 12. So the number 12 immediately means we need to think about the 12 tribes of Israel or the 12 apostles. Now this is where it gets tricky because in Revelation sometimes the 12s refer to the people of God in the Old Testament, the people of God at the time of writing, or sometimes to the church. And so the easiest thing to do is to think about it in terms of the people of God, the faithful, the, the community of faith. And so the woman represents the, the community of faith. That's what the 12 stars point us towards. And another writer also makes the point that um, in Joseph's dreams in the beginning of uh, in Genesis, where he comes to his brothers and says, I've had a vision of uh, the sun, the moon and 11 stars bowing down to me. He would have been the 12th star that effectively it reminds us of this community of faith of Israel. So she represents the community of faith. And this idea of pain waiting to give birth is a symbol, uh, is an imagery that's used time and time again by the prophets to kind of talk about Israel whilst they're under persecution, whilst they're under the hammer, waiting for God's salvation and rescue. We see that in Isaiah 26. And so we have this picture of God's people crying out in pain because they are being persecuted, they are under immense pressure. And we saw that in chapter 1, that that's very much what the early church was going through that uh, John is writing to in the region around Ephesus, um, under pressure to conform to worshipping the emperor, under pressure to kind of either give up their faith or return to Judaism. Um, the sun represents glory. We talked about that in the, the first week again. So uh, God's glorious people, God's glorious church. And it talks about the moon being under their feet. So anything that's under the feet of something implies authority. So God, we know at the end of uh, <clears throat> Jesus's life on the earth, he tells the disciples, I have given you authority as the father gave me authority. And there's another thing that we can do here is in Revelation, John loves to contrast things. So here we have a picture of faithful mother, the faithful mother versus the unfaithful prostitute, as we read later in Revelation 17, and also Jerusalem versus Babylon. So what we have is this idea of faithful mother Jerusalem, um, 
that's depicted in this in in Revelation versus the unfaithful uh, prostitute Babylon. So there's that imagery going on as well. So it's all about faithfulness under persecution. And then we come across another character. This red dragon appears. Another sign appears in the sky, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and seven crowns on its heads. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky. Now, obviously, as a proud Welshman, um, red dragons are a beautiful thing to me. But unfortunately, my friend here, the red dragon, is um, in this case not something to be celebrated. Um, in the Old Testament, dragons, leviathans, sea monsters, any sort of monstrous type creature always represents the evil one. So in Isaiah uh, 27, we see this kind of sea monster and sea monsters in particular because of the, the way that sea represents chaos in the Hebrew thought. But here we have this idea that the devil, the dragon represents Satan, the devil, as we'll see a little bit later on. So in the Old Testament in particular, and particularly with the prophets, these monsters usually represent um, the oppressive kingdoms, the ones that are oppressing Israel, the ones that are mistreating Israel, attacking Israel. So we know that um, in Isaiah it's, it's Egypt that's picked out to be um, like a, a, a monster. And we know from verse 9 that actually what's it saying here is that Satan <clears throat> is actually this monster. So effectively behind the kingdoms that oppress, behind the kingdoms that are fighting with Israel, oppressing Israel, oppressing and persecuting God's people is Satan himself. Um, the red probably represents the blood of God's people that actually, you know, this monster is, has killed and, and, you know, been uh, on the rampage against God's people. Um, seven heads and ten crowns. Well, seven and ten are numbers that John likes to use to represent completeness or wholeness. So effectively what this is saying is that the, the evil that this dragon is doing, the mayhem this dragon causes, affects all of the earth. That actually it's not just confined to a, one small space. That actually he is the evil behind all the things that are going on, behind all oppressive regimes, behind all um, destruction and harm that's being done. Um, and, you know, sweeping the stars out of the sky is just another picture of just carnage and destruction. So we have this faithful, the faithful, the community of faith being oppressed, being um, attacked by um, evil kingdoms and Satan behind them is the root cause of what's going on. But then we have this, this picture of this woman gives birth to a child and um, who will rule the nations with an iron scepter. Now we know from Psalm 2 that God intends that his son will rule with an iron scepter. Um, and so what we're seeing here is that out of God's faithful people will come God's Messiah. So we see that obviously in the beginning of the New Testament with Jesus being born into the people of God. And the Effectively, what we're seeing here is this child is the one that will come and rule and reign in righteousness. So the iron scepter, ruling with an iron scepter is normally looking ahead. Um, but we see here her child is snatched up to God and to his throne. So what we actually have is the entirety of Jesus's life, um, his suffering, his persecution, his death, his resurrection and his ascension to his father all in one verse. So it effectively condenses it all down into the life of this child. And it also alludes to the, the idea that actually um, the devil will try to kill all the infants. So this idea that the baby, the de dragon is waiting to snatch the baby up the minute it's born. And so we see, obviously, with Herod um, ordering the execution of all the young children in an attempt to destroy the saviour before he was able to get going, effectively. Um, and so what we have here is this child is born, he comes to earth, he rules and reigns, and then he is ascended to the father's throne. But what happens to the woman? Well, we know that she has this 1,260 days um, of in the wilderness. Now, the reason the 1,260 days is chosen is um, this is a number that crops up a couple of times in Revelation. It generally means um, the most important thing to realise is that it's a limited amount of time. Um, that actually what it's saying is between Jesus' ascension and his return, the woman will be in the wilderness. The woman will suffer a great deal of persecution. The woman will go through some tough times. Um, and that Satan, as we'll see later on in the passage, will kind of thrash about trying to persecute her offspring. So effectively, in summary, what we have here is the, the fake community of faith under pressure being persecuted, that God's Son and Saviour will come through them, um, that he will return to the Father. But after that ascension, there will be a period where the church will be persecuted, where there will the, the, the woman or the church um, will go through tough times, difficult times, because of the persecution of the evil kingdoms of this earth and Satan behind them. But it's interesting, isn't it, that it says that God snatches her away to the wilderness, to a place prepared for her. And when you stop and think, why wilderness? Because surely wilderness is harsh and barren. It's not what the place you would typically think of as a refuge, as a safe place, a place of comfort. Um, and so 
I think the problem with that is that for us, reading in the 21st century, when we look back on the wilderness journeys of Israel, what we think is it's a place of shame, a place of punishment, that it's harsh and unforgiving, that they end up in the wilderness for 40 years because of their wrongdoing. But that's not the picture here, because in Jewish thought, the wilderness is something else entirely. That yes, it does refer to those 40 years, but actually it refers to a time when Israel was totally dependent on God, on his presence with them and on his provision, that he was going to look after them and care for them. So for them, wilderness becomes um, a really precious thing, a really precious moment in their history. Um, and in fact, in, in Hebrew, the, the book of Numbers is actually called um, Bar Midbar, which means wilderness. Um, and actually in the Midrash, which is some ancient rabbinic sources who are explaining what the pas passages in Scripture mean, they say about the beginning of Numbers um, that unless you become Bar Bar Midbar, you will not acquire Torah. So what they're saying is, um, in the beginning of in the beginning of the book of Numbers, it says, um, in the wilderness of Sinai, God spoke to mine, uh, to Moses in the tent of meeting. So in the in the wilderness, so the book is called Wilderness. Um, but what they're saying is, they talk about that passage is that we too must become wilderness. And what they're saying there is that we need to kind of empty ourselves of our own self reliance and independence and depend on God and rely on God, and that is how we will acquire what God wants for us. And so I think there's something about that for us, that as we think about wilderness, as we think about tough times in our lives, when we think about those moments when things are hard, when we're under persecution, when we feel beset on all sides, that actually there's something about letting go of our own dependence on ourselves, of stopping trying to solve all our problems ourselves and actually inviting God into the situation and walking with God through the wilderness. I think one of the most beloved Psalms of all time is Psalm 23, where it says, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. God's presence with us in the midst of hard times, in the midst of persecution. Because here's the thing, this passage says between the ascension of Jesus and his return, we will be in the wilderness. And actually wilderness is normal. Anyone who tells you otherwise is kidding themselves. Life is tough. Life is really hard. Some of us experience wilderness all the time, that these really difficult moments in our lives, life can seem like an unending wilderness. But the promise of God is not necessarily that he's going to rescue us from the wilderness. The promise of God is that he's going to walk through the wilderness with us, that he is enough, that he will provide what we need. He will give us the strength, the courage, the peace to keep going and keep moving forwards. So we're going to take a break and we're going to look at the next little bit of the passage. So well, let's move to a different bit of the house just to change the scenery. So let's continue to read the passage. So looking at verse 7. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down. That ancient snake called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. So what we have here is this picture, possibly, of what was going on in heaven at the time of the crucifixion. That actually, as this earthly event was happening in human history, there was this heavenly battle taking place. And some commentators think that this is the, that, that moment where Satan is hurled out of heaven as Michael and the angels defeat him. Now, Michael is always depicted in scripture as the defender of God's people. We see that in Daniel 10 and 12. And so effectively we have this idea that Satan rebels against God in heaven and is kind of defeated and expelled, but not killed or destroyed. He's thrown to the earth. Um, and actually that then kind of during this time of persecution kind of sets the backdrop to the dragon then um, persecuting God's people. Um, and so, you know, the time scales in this, this passage kind of jump backwards and forwards a little bit. And then what we have is the declaration of this victory. So in verse 10, it says "Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah for the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. And here we have this picture of Satan as the accuser. Um, and in, in some ways, the, the way that we, we see this in Scripture is most notably in Job. So at the beginning of Job, there's this moment where Satan kind of 
goes to God and, and God says, have you seen my servant Job? And God says, well, of course he's a good guy. He's got nothing to worry about. He's got all this stuff you've blessed him with. Go on, I bet if you stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, he will surely curse you to your face. And so there's this idea of uh, that role that Satan had of accusing God's people to God's um, in, the, in the heavenly courts. So he's the one who basically accuses God's people, runs them down, tells them they're rubbish and they're not good for anything. And actually, that's something we still experience today. Because as the Satan, as the great accuser, flails around here on earth, um, one of the things that he does again and again and again is pile on the guilt that effectively makes us feel like we're not good enough, we're not worthy, we're not... Um, we don't deserve God's help. We don't deserve God's presence with us. We don't deserve to have prayers answered. We don't deserve to have forgiveness. We don't deserve any of these things. And actually, there are so many people I encounter in, in life who are so piled up with guilt and are worried about um, what God thinks of them. You know, I can remember when I was younger, um, I remember going to a, a, a meeting and uh, the preacher um, in this Brethren Chapel being um, full of fire and brimstone and basically saying that um, Jesus is going to return soon. And I remember thinking, but I'm not ready. Um, I haven't got myself sorted out. I've still got loads of stuff I want to do. I've still got um, stuff that I want to do so that God will think I've been a good and faithful servant that actually I'll get a well done when I go to heaven. But at the moment, I've not achieved anything or done anything for God. So um, I'm not ready to go yet. And that's completely wrong because that basically puts God in the place of a heavenly school teacher. And we're worried about going to see him because we're not going to get the report card that we think we deserve. We're not going to get the the results that we think we deserve because we we haven't quite got ready for it yet. And so the key thing here is to realise that it's not all about us. That's one of the great Christian truths is the fact that it's not about what we do, it's not about our striving, it's not about our screw-ups. Ultimately, it's about Jesus. Because the passage goes on to say, they, being God's people, triumphed over the accuser by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. So God's way is very different to the world's way. That victory for us is not won by picking up a sword and and fighting the enemy. That actually... God's victory comes when God's people persevere, when God's people um, hold on to their faith, hold on to their trust in God um, and accept what God has done for us. By the blood of the lamb here is referring to the fact that Jesus is death on the cross. Jesus is sacrifice for us. He is the lamb that was slain to take away the sins of the world. He is the one that deals with all the things that we do wrong. He's the one who's paid the price. So actually, I don't need to be fearful. I don't need to listen to that voice in my head that's saying you're not good enough. That voice in my head that's saying God doesn't really love you. If he knew all the stuff that you did, if only everyone knew what you were like, those voices, those unhelpful voices are not from God. They're from the accuser. God's voice says to us, my son died for you. God's voice says to us, I love you. And by my grace, you are healed. By my grace, I have restored you to relationship with me. It's something God does and Jesus did on the cross, not something we have to do. So we need to accept that grace. And if you're watching this today and you're piling the guilt and shame on yourself, stop now. Just go to God. Say, I'm sorry for the things I've done wrong, but because of your son, will you forgive me? Because of what he did on the cross, help me to know I'm forgiven. Help me to know that I can have a good relationship with you. Help me to know that I can approach the heavenly throne with confidence, not fearful of the things that I've done wrong in my life, but with confidence because of Jesus, not because of me. And then it talks about the testimony. And they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. And I think there's something for us in that fact that God calls us not to keep falling into the trap of living the way the world lives, to actually be willing to live life differently, to give up our lives, our desires, our kind of chasing after stuff and live the way he wants us to live, to be willing to share who Jesus is, what he has done for us with people that we encounter, to love people the way Jesus and God have loved us. So there's something about that living life a different way. That's how we triumph over the accuser. Because if we give in to those voices, if we give in to him, we just go the way of everything else. The passage goes on, Therefore rejoice you heavens and you who dwell in them, but woe to the earth and the sea because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury because he knows his time is short. And the picture here is the fact that 
even though that heavenly victory happened, he is still going to cause a lot of trouble. And the picture I always use for this, and sorry if you've heard it a thousand times, is D-Day. At that moment in human history on June the 6th, 1944, the Allied armies, once they gained a foothold on the continent, the end of the war was pretty much guaranteed. But that didn't mean that from that point right up until the conquest of Berlin, that there weren't battles and that people didn't die. That there was a struggle still ahead, but that victory was certain, but there were still battles to be fought. And that's true for us, that even though we know that God has won that final victory, that actually there's still those ongoing battles to be fought until that day when Jesus returns and all is put right. And we know from scripture in Ephesians 6, it says, be strong in the Lord, put on the full armor so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes for your struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. So in this life that God calls us to live, in this life that God wants us to experience in all its fullness, we want to experience that freedom that God has for us, that knowledge that God has forgiven us because of his son. But we're also called to continue the struggle. And the primary way we do that is by holding fast to our faith and trusting God, to know who we are and what God has done for us, to be willing to share something of that with others through our lives and our deeds and our words, but also to pray because prayer is where we engage in that spiritual battle. Prayer is where we engage with those rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. So prayer is vital to our life together, that we engage in prayer, that we might overcome the accuser. Let's pray. Father God, I pray now for each and every one of us. Remind us afresh that we are forgiven. Remind us afresh that the Son died for us, that the Lamb was slain, and that because of his sacrifice, we can know full forgiveness. And then help us to live a life that is a testimony to all you are and all you have done for us. And Lord, may we hold on to our faith in good times and in bad times. Lord, as we struggle on through the wilderness, Lord, will you help us to learn the lessons of letting go of our own self-independence and reliance and depending on you. And Lord, would each one of us watching this in the coming week experience more of your presence with us and your provision for us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. Silence the boast of sin and grace. The heavens are roaring. The praise of your glory. For you are raised to life again. You have no
thank you so much for being with us this morning and thank you to Dave and Matt for the worship. It's been really great um, having this time together. Yeah, and um, Dave mentioned at the end of his talk about the importance of prayer and how that's a big calling on our lives and that's how we're going to engage in this spiritual battle that we find ourselves in. Um, you might be asking yourself, wow, I wish that there was a way that I could find out more mm, <laughs> about is prayer. Is there a way? Yeah. So tonight at the evening service, the very wonderful um, and talented Abby Douglas is going to be sharing with us, uh, continuing our series called What is Church? And she's going to be answering that question by saying that prayer is something that the church is dependent on. So she's going to be unpacking that for us. So we're very excited. Yeah. So that's, that's tonight at 6.30 on YouTube or Facebook. Um, please make sure that you come and watch that. It's going to be a really good one. Yeah. And for everything else happening during the week and to find out if you would like to join us in person on a Sunday, um, do check the website uh, or contact admin at thecommunitychurch.net and I can set you up with Dave's email or anything else that you may need. Amazing. Um, I have remembered before we go, um, it is also Dave Hathaway's birthday today. Ooh, so yes. special shout out for Dave Hath. Sorry if you spent this whole time seething that I got a shout out and you didn't. Um, but here it is. Dave Hath, hope you have a wonderful day. Um, and the rest of you as well. Have a great rest of your Sunday, whatever you're up to. We'll hopefully see you tonight at the evening service. And if not, same time next week here on YouTube. Bye. Bye.